All right, well, I'll get started. Um, welcome to Preservation North Carolina Shelter Series. I'm Julianne Patterson and I'm PNC's Outreach Manager. We started this series about places that matter last year and learned that these virtual events created access to connect with more of you across the state. Our annual statewide preservation conference is also virtual this year and taking place next month, October 21st and 22nd. Details, registration information and recordings of past programs are all available on our website, preservationnc.org. We love that we can present the shelter series to you free of charge. Um, if you're enjoying this series, please consider a gift or sponsorship to help us keep it going. There's a giving link in the survey that will appear at the end of the program, and you can always visit our website to make a donation later. This afternoon, we're excited to present Architecture and Ambition at Airmount. Our presenter is Dr. Jeffrey Klee, who is the Vice President and Senior Director of Architecture for the Classical American Homes Preservation Trust. For the previous 16 years, he was an architectural historian for the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation, where he conducted field-based research throughout the Chesapeake region to support the preservation and reconstruction of buildings in Williamsburg's historic area. His larger scholarly work focuses on American domestic architecture from the colonial period to the Civil War. Before I turn it over to Jeff, I just wanna go over a few housekeeping items for those of you who might be new to the shelter series. Um, so it is a webinar, so we cannot see you or hear you. Um, so no worries there. Um, I'll moderate questions at the end of the presentation. Please feel free to ask them at any time, um, just using the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom window. Um, if you're having any technical issues, you can let me know typing into the chat and I'll do my best to help you. And as I mentioned earlier, a brief survey will pop up when you exit the webinar. If you have a moment to give us feedback, it really helps us improve and find out what works. Um, you can leave any comments, suggestions for future programs, anything like that. Um, thank you again for joining us. And now I will turn it over to Jeff. Great, thank you, Julianne. Um, and thank you to everyone at Preservation North Carolina for, um, uh, for inviting me to give this talk. I'm really looking forward to speaking with all of you. Um, my, only, my only small regret is I, I can't see all of 150 of you or some enormous number of people that have signed up for this. So um, I do look forward to the day when we can do these sorts of things in, in person again, because it's wonderful to feel, feel the sort of energy of the room when there's a, when there's a nice big crowd like this. Uh, but I'll just, I think we'll all just carry on and I'll pretend I can feel that energy through the, uh, through the intertubes. So, um, let's get started. Uh, the basic facts of Airmount are well known to this audience. Scottish merchant William Kirkland built it in 1815 on his large property at the edge of Hillsborough. An impressive three-part house, it was more substantial than nearly any other private building around for miles, and one of a very small number of brick buildings in all of Piedmont, North Carolina. Only Duncan Cameron's nearby Farintosh cut as fine a figure, but it was built of wood and was a more conventionally planned house. Cameron and Kirkland shared many things, including Scottish origins and a taste for elaborate architecture. They also shared tradespeople, using the same group of skilled individuals for the masonry, carpentry, and finished joinery. The house passed through the descendants of William Kirkland after his death in 1836 until it was sold out of the family for the first time in 1985 to Richard Jenrette. This basic story has been well documented by Jean Anderson and is recounted in her biography of Kirkland as well as the house's National Register nomination. Following his purchase in 1985, Dick Jenrette undertook a thorough restoration of the house under the guidance of Todd Dickinson. A nonprofit established by Mr. Jenrette called Classical American Homes Preservation Trust currently owns the house and is my employer. When I joined the trust about a year ago, part of my job was to determine what else could be learned to allow us to strengthen our interpretation of it. I began with a close examination of the building as it stands, inside and out, and from top to bottom. Although actually, I think, uh, to be perfectly honest, that's not entirely true. I began with calls to Catherine Beischer and Peter Sandbeck, uh, and I want to thank Catherine especially for talking me through many of the problems that I'll be uh, laying out for you uh, this afternoon. What I'll present this afternoon is a summary of the house's form and some of its more unusual and puzzling elements as a way of introducing an overriding theme that I find useful for making sense of the house and understanding its importance to William Kirkland. To a Virginian raised in New England, I do find it unusual. Our question is, to what extent are the oddities of Airmount a reflection of William Kirkland's ambition? And to what extent do they manifest a much broader change in the practice of architecture and building across the United States in this period? 
and the analysis I will present today, I focus my attention on three aspects of this building, all of which were exceptional for their time and place, and all of which have characteristics that demand explanation. The building's floor plan, its woodwork, and its masonry. Together, I see the unusual qualities of these elements as signs of a transitional phase in the development of American architecture from a process that was largely conventional and local toward one that was more cosmopolitan, cel celebrating novelty and invention over the familiar and the commonplace. This transition was not an easy one. Air mount was part of a new trend in domestic architecture that favored more elaborate and more freewheeling ornament, a more thorough use of the classical language of design and a movement away from city centers. Beginning in the 1790s, in many Eastern towns and cities, including Boston, Philadelphia, and even Little Beaufort, South Carolina, wealthy merchants built showy houses outside the busy city center, but close enough to keep an eye on trade. Built on large parcels at a convenient distance, we might think of such buildings as proto-suburban. Many of these merchants' houses were also architecturally ambitious. Air Mount is part of another trend of this period, that of building three-part and five-part houses, which are sometimes called Palladian. What I mean by a three-part house is clearest in this view, which shows the house's large two-story center section flanked by two lower wings. In the decades after the American Revolution, there was a proliferation of three-part houses built by prosperous homeowners throughout Virginia, Maryland, and North Carolina. Such houses are often described as evidence of the long reach of Palladio's influence. But I think it has to be said that these are mostly built by patrons who had no need of pattern books to determine the form of their houses. It's clearly the case that their builders preferred symmetry and a well-ordered elevation with a generic European pedigree, but not specifically an Italian or even an English one. So to call these Palladian, I think, robs the term of any real meaning. So I prefer to stick with the term three-part or multi-part house for buildings like this. It also diminishes the skill of the tradespeople who built them making them passive rather than active agents in determining the house's form. Enough editorializing. In the case of Airmount's builders, we can name two with confidence, thanks to letters to and from William Kirkland, the mason William Collier and the carpenter John Joyner Briggs. A third, Joyner L. Hannon Nutt, is suggested by his collaboration with Collier and Briggs on other houses, as well as the similarity of the woodwork at Airmount to that of Farintosh, where Nutt is known to have worked. Their client, and no less important for, de for determining Airmount's form, was William Kirkland. Kirkland had moved to Hillsborough from Scotland by the 1790s and spent the next 20 years enlarging his mercantile operation, his fortune, and his family. All three were at their peak in 1815 when Airmount was completed and William and, Mar and Margaret Scott Kirkland moved into their new house with their large family. The house was stylish, inside and out. Its most outwardly impressive aspect was its composition as a three-part house, a novel means of making a polite house architecturally distinctive, and not one and one not confined to North, confined to North Carolina. This cousin of Airmount is the William Finney House in Williamsburg, Virginia, where it was built in the 1770s. As you can see immediately, it, like the house in Hillsborough, has a large center mass flanked by two lower wings, but it is quite a bit smaller than the Kirkland House, and it's also timber-framed rather than brick. It is somewhat less impressive, it must be said, but clearly playing the same visual and architectural game, though it is several decades older than Airmount. The Finney House stands in for dozens of others built on the Eastern seaboard in the decades after the American Revolution. Despite their popularity, such houses presented some challenges to their builders, starting with how to arrange the floor plan. Gentry builders in this period liked to connect their principal rooms on each floor by means of a hallway or a passage that permitted movement through the house by servants, guests, and family members without disturbing the activities in the principal rooms. At Airmount, this is managed by a deep passage, which doubles as an entry. And this element is only possible because the building is so large at 40 by 40 feet square in the center section and 25 feet square in the wings. Compare this to the Finney House plan, shown here at the same scale. As originally built, the Finney House dispensed with the passage, meaning that guests entered the house directly into one of the principal rooms. Note too that this requires the stair to be pushed to a cramped back corner of one of the wings, reducing the size of the adjoining room considerably. The builders of the Finney House tolerated a relatively inconvenient plan for the sake of a, si of a stylish front. The more conventional arrangement of rooms in a polite house right up to the Civil War 
ran the passage down the center of the plan with one or two rooms arranged symmetrically on either side. The center passage plan was convenient, suited 18th and 19th century tastes for domestic accommodation well, and was by far the commonest plan for large gentry houses in this period. The air mount plan works better, although, although as you can see, only three of the rooms are directly accessible from the passage. One, labeled warming room by the Habs crew who drew it in the 1960s, can only re be reached from the dining room and the room labeled library. As you can gather by my qualifying language, I have my doubts about some of this terminology. In making sense of historic buildings, it is vital to have a clear understanding of room use. So I just wanna take a few minutes to review what the evidence is for use in each of these rooms and to consider what the conventional period uses for them was. The clearest rooms on the ground floor are the two on the right-hand side of this plan, the dining room and the parlor. Here, I show you an overview of the dining room, a designation that is quite plausible. This is one of the two most lavishly outfitted rooms in the house and therefore clearly a public reception room. So the universe of possibilities is relatively narrow. It's either a parlor or a dining room. And in this case, it's surely a dining room based on this large piece of built-in cabinetry to the right of the fireplace. This is variously called a buffet or a bow fat. And it's an original piece of built-in cabinetry that's used to, to store and display tablewares. You might suppose that this is used for some other kind of storage such as bed linens or clothes. But the fact that the two center doors are fitted with glass is totally consistent with the way that Americans use this form from the, ninth, from the 18th century. The doors in a dining room buffet were glazed to permit the display of tablewares, just as they are presented in this view. So we identify this as the dining room. So far, so good. The room that adjoins the dining room but doesn't connect with it is this one. This room is in the right-hand wing of Airmount, and like the dining room, is very well finished. In fact, if I switch back and forth, this room and the dining room, I think you can see a very clear correspondence in the woodwork of these two rooms. The cornice is identical, and the overmantel is virtually identical, with, in both cases, a field of panels surrounding a frame for a portrait. In the dining room, that portrait was of William Kirkland, who was hung there for 200 years, according to family tradition. While in this room, we have a portrait of Thomas Jefferson currently, who I should point out is not a Kirkland. <laughs> this portrait was hung here by Richard Hampton Jenrett. Additionally, the woodwork in both rooms has the freewheeling and exuberant quality of American neoclassicism of the opening decades of the 19th century. These rooms, both meant for public reception, both large and well-finished, are meant to operate as a pair, with guests circulating between them over the course of an evening's entertainment. In many houses of this period, the parlor and the dining room were open to one another to facilitate the movements of guests. But here, the use of the three-part plan does not allow direct communication between them. Let's return to that plan for a moment, now with the two public and best finished rooms in the house shaded at the right. Their functions as parlor and dining room are reasonably clear, as is that of the stair passage at the front, which is here labeled front hall. That leaves these other two rooms on the opposite side of the house at its Eastern end, whose roles are less evident. That said, we do have some idea about what those roles might've been. The function of this room to begin with is relatively clear. It is not as finely finished as the paired public rooms at the other end of the passage. Note the cornice, which is a much more conventional affair, just a crown molding instead of those elaborate Gothic drops in the parlor and dining room. The mantle too is more restrained, though certainly speaking the same language as those in the parlor and dining room. Like them, it has an enormously high ceiling at 13 feet, six inches tall. But this is simply a function of it being on the ground floor rather than a clue to its relative status. Finally, let's look again at the floor plan and note how the access to this room from the passage is shielded somewhat by the stair as we'll see more clearly in a later image. So this is the door here, the principal door to that room. In its finishes and, its, and, in, and in its position on the ground floor, this is a relatively private room. Finally, there is another built-in cabinet in this room to the right of the fireplace. Unlike in the dining room, all of its doors are solid, so it is not meant for display, only for storage. As such, it is likely for linens, in this case, bed linens. As many of you already know, 
In Virginia and in North Carolina, it was common in the 18th and early 19th centuries for the best bedchamber to be located on the ground floor. The core of a polite house consisted of three first floor rooms, a parlor, a dining room, and a bedchamber. Larger houses might have a fourth, but its purpose varied widely. At Airmount, the size, location, and relative status of its woodwork lead us to conclude that this room was a bedchamber for Mr. and Mrs. Kirkland. That leads us to this room, the smallest on the ground floor and labeled on the Habs drawings as the warming room, a charming but non-committal designation that may be intended to suggest that it was part of the service function of the house, somehow related to food preparation for the adjoining uh, dining room. Based on the high quality of its finishes and its central location in the plan between the chamber and the dining room, I think this is unlikely. What is it then? And what do we have to go on? First, this is the smallest room in the house, and it is similarly finished to the bedchamber, which we just left, although its mantle is not quite as elaborately decorated as the others on the ground floor. It doesn't have those wonderful curved console brackets on either side of its frieze, for example. So the finishes suggest that this is a room of secondary importance. Supporting this reading is the fact that it has no direct access from the public passage. In other words, it can only be reached through the dining room or through the principal bedchamber, so it clearly is a more private room, one that could be sealed off from public view. And so just to make this clear, this is the stair passage, the main circulation area of the house. This is the dining room, and here is one door to get into this little back room, and then here is the other door to get into that little back room leading in from the, the bedchamber over here. Other possibilities though, excuse me, but we already have the best first floor bedchamber in the adjoining room. So if it is a chamber, it is a secondary one. Other possibilities though are more likely based on contemporary elite houses. One option is as a secondary dining room. Robert Carter III's Nominai Hall in Westmoreland County, Virginia, made famous by Philip Vickers Fithian's wonderful diary and another very large mansion, had a large public dining room for ceremonial purposes as well as a smaller private dining room reserved for family members. Another possibility is a kind of domestic office, a place where Mrs. Kirkland could run the large complex household. There are a handful of examples of domestic offices in large houses of this period in Virginia and North Carolina. This room is much bigger than the ones that I know about, however, so perhaps this is not the most likely, but I do think it has to be considered in the realm of possibilities. Finally, another option is that this room was for William Kirkland himself as a professional study or office. Here too, it is large for an office, but nonetheless, it is the smallest room on the ground floor. The puzzles of Airmount's floor plan are simply par for the course in working on historic buildings. Scholars often have to guess at room functions in houses of this kind. The Habs historians made one guess in 1965, and we have amended and updated that 50 years on. Some of, Air, some of Airmount's other curiosities concerning its woodwork and its masonry are of a different kind, however, and offer us a glimpse into some of the social dynamics of architecture in this period. They are signs, to my eye, of a profession that was in transition and not just in Hillsborough. Some aspects of Airmount's woodwork are conventional in their context, which is to say in a national context. The title of my talk today is derived from an advertisement that L. Hannon Nutt placed on the Raleigh Star in June of 1811, when he boasted that he was capable of executing finished joinery like mantles, staircases, and wainscoting in a stylish, up-to-the-minute fashion. In his words, in a superior manner to what has been customary in this place. Nutt was offering work that was more cosmopolitan or a la mode than what he characterized as the more plain spoken work of his predecessors and his competitors. And it is true that his work at Airmount was more expressive than the earlier building, than that of earlier buildings in the region. This image on screen shows a relatively restrained mantle on the second floor in one of the two principal bedchambers on that level. Note, for example, the horizontal reading on the two flanking panels in the frieze, and pay particular attention to the mantle surround itself, which is not a single, a double, or even a triple architrave. This is a quadruple architrave, an exceptional and very unconventional manipulation of the classical language of design. We've already seen this one, which is downstairs in the dining room and is the most frequently photographed and the most elaborate mantle in the house. It is a wonderfully freewheeling composition. It is composed of classical elements, yes, but those elements have been combined and recombined in very inventive ways. To take just one example, 
Note this alternating row of daisy wheels and triglyphs at the bottom band of the mantle, combining a workman's decoration with an element of the Doric order. And I'm talking about this band right here. Above it is a pulvinated frieze, itself a part of the Ionic order. And then above that, this row of bullseyes. This really is an extraordinary composition. The most conventional thing about it, I suppose, are the flanking pilasters and the little guilloche surrounding the fireplace opening. Now, the author of this woodwork was L. Hannon Nutt, who also worked on Farintosh, Duncan Cameron's house. We've attributed this work to Nutt because two of Farintosh's other builders, William Collier and John Joyner Briggs, also worked on Airmount, but also because of the strong similarity in the woodwork of these two houses. On the left is a room at Farintosh, and on the right, the dining room at Airmount. The mantles are not identical, but they have a strong family resemblance. The wainscoting, too, is handled in a very similar manner. Now, I don't want to give you the wrong idea that this kind of elaboration, this inventive use of the classical language of design was unique to Elhan and Nutt. Far from it, though his particular idiom does seem to be distinctive, but he was not the only joiner in North Carolina capable of manipulating the classical language in this way, nor was William Kirkland the only patron interested in such inventive work. The range of possibilities for decorative woodwork in the opening decades of the 19th century was much wider than it had been in the more straight-laced Georgian era, and not just in North Carolina. This 18-teens mantle from a small house in Caswell County illustrates how the taste for novelty extended throughout the state. If you look closely, you'll see some of the same motifs from Airmount's woodwork, like a little band of triglyphs, though here they're really quintglyphs, if I can coin a term, once again alternating with little daisy wheels. And here, the frieze is terminated with a pair of flattened urns, which are decorated with fanciful little incised ornaments. This example from the same period is for the most part more conventional, except for the treatment of the frieze, which is terminated by a pair of S-curved panels. This treatment is typical of a whole series of mantles in Beaufort, which sometimes combine motifs in eccentric ways, but all of which use these S-curved flanking panels. And not everyone wanted anything so expressive so some builders were content simply to update more conventional mantle compositions with new moldings like this one in Raleigh. Though the piece de resistance, resistance here is its wonderful decorative painting, which has somehow survived wonderfully after two centuries. Finally, some clients of this period preferred a more literate and more academic kind of classicism with which to ornament their mantles. But they too chose much more exuberant work than what characterized the decorations of the previous century. This mantle from the eastern shore of Virginia with its elegant neoclassical motifs was purchased from a catalog. It was from Robert Welford, who was a mantle maker and composition ornament dealer in Philadelphia, who supplied homeowners throughout the eastern United States with mass produced ornaments with a distinguished Greco-Roman pedigree. But William Kirkland chose to work with local tradespeople rather than import his talent from abroad. While its mantles are marvelous, and which and draw a visitor's attention most effectively, it is another aspect of Airmount's finished woodwork that is still more distinctive and more significant, and that is its wainscoting. Like its mantles, this wain the wainscoting is freewheeling, but its defiance of convention seems to be constrained to a very small number of houses, perhaps only those made by Nutt. This view of the parlor at Stagville illustrates the conventional arrangement for wainscoting with a, very, with a single large panel set in a frame and capped by a decorative surbase. The surbase here, and I'm talking about this horizontal element here and the wainscoting of course is down here. The surbase here is at the same height as the windowsill. So the relationship of wainscoting to windows is orderly and conventional. Only at the mantle surround does the wainscoting rise above the dado to form a decorative paneled overmantle. Solutions of this kind, with low one panel high wainscoting around the room and a high paneled fireplace wall, were commonplace for gentry builders in the 18th and early 19th centuries. This was a decorative convention, universally understood and hardly needing explanation. Less common was the occasional practice of adding a smaller second row of panels above the first frequently used for colonial era box pews whose high sides virtually demanded this treatment some house builders also opted for higher paneling in their best rooms, such as the dining room of Salubria in Culpeper County, Virginia. But it was rare, 
And where this treatment was used, the small upper panels aligned over the large lower ones, as they do here. The styles, that is to say, the vertical members of the frame that surrounds each piece of paneling, are continuous. At Airmount, Nutt installed this same kind of high-waisted wainscoting, but with a critical difference. The panels don't align. The horizontal rail is the element that's continuous, while the verticals are interrupted, so the panels only occasionally line up. And this is not just in the dining room. It is everywhere in the principal rooms on the first and second floor. This view is on the second floor in the passage, and I think you can see even more clearly the way in which the composition of the upper panels has nothing to do with the arrangement of the panels below. The lower ones tend all to be the same size, whereas, si whereas the sizes of the upper panels varies considerably. Now you might suppose that this misalignment of panels has something to do with some practical or structural function, perhaps to achieve a neat fit between window openings, for example. But it's clearly a compositional choice. And the best place to see that is here in the stair, where there's absolutely no reason for the upper panels not to align with the lower ones. And yet here, as you can see in the panels running up the side of the staircase, those very long horizontals in the upper range have nothing to do with those below. And here I'm talking about this paneling uh, right here with the long upper panels. So I suggest that we can chalk this up to a compositional eccentricity, a novelty certainly, and a sign of how L. Hen and Nutt indulged William Kirkland's desire to build in a superior manner. But this is the point in the talk where we observe how building ambitiously, ambitiously and embracing novelty brings a special set of challenges. In this view of the stairs, I want to draw your attention to another part of the wainscoting. Here in the corner, just right over here, where the wall to the chamber intersects with the paneling under the stair at the left side of this image. Here is a detail of that intersection. And I want to focus your attention on the area to the right of the doorway in the corner where this field of raised paneling intersects with the field of flat paneling. So right here. And even if you hadn't looked, haven't looked at hundreds of 18th and 19th century buildings, I suspect this intersection will strike you as odd. The way in which the vertical style of the wainscoting under the stair is sort of slammed up into the middle of the raised panels of the adjoining wall. If so, your instincts are good. This is odd. And is not the way that any joiner would ever choose to put together wainscoting in an 18th or 19th century house. To make it in this way not only looks poorly, it is exceedingly difficult to cope the style to those panels in a neat manner, as it was done here. It reflects, therefore, a change that was made to the layout of the house in the middle of construction. And if you doubt me, and I welcome that, let's go on the other side of this wall. In the plan, the area I was just showing you is this intersection right here at the stair and the front passage. What I'm now going to show you is a view looking into this closet. So this closet here on the other side of that wall. Uh, and it's in this closet where the secret of what's going on here is revealed. In this view, we're looking into that closet underneath the stair and you'll immediately recognize that something is wrong here. There's absolutely no reason to install expensive wainscoting in a closet. That the paneling extends beyond the doorway is telling us that something has changed in this house. The joiners installed the wainscoting around and under the stair while there was a doorway between the passage and this small back room. One of the rooms, as you recall, that we were struggling to define a purpose for. And that door is the door which is open here, allowing us a peek into this closet. So it appears that William Kirkland, seeing this arrangement and recognizing that it would permit access to this room from a public part of the house, told his builders to seal it up by installing a wall underneath the stair so that the little vestibule that formerly allowed access to this back room from the passage simply became a closet under the stairs, capturing this fragment of wainscoting for us to find today. Now, this is the sort of thing that gets an architectural historian like me pretty excited because there's a story here, a story that speaks to the difficulty of building a certain kind of house, an ambitious house or an unconventional house. But we might be inclined to brush it off as little more than a curiosity a commonplace enough occurrence in house construction, except that it happened again. This is the stair leading from the second floor to the attic. And you'll recognize here again that the panels in the wainscoting don't align as, as in the other parts of the house. But other than that, 
This looks unremarkable, unless you look very closely at the base of the stair, where the stair seems to simply slice out a section of the wainscoting in an unusual way. If we take a look inside this closet underneath the stair, we can see why. Once again, we have in a closet under a stair, some original wainscoting, though here it was never even painted. In fact, it still has Elhen and Nutt's pencil markers on it. This is to me, one of the most extraordinary things about this house. We can see quite clearly that the stair was installed after the wainscoting went in, but before the plastering was laid on the brick walls. And therefore, that it was only after the wainscoting was installed that William Kirkland requested that the stair be run up from the second to the third floor. There was no reason for this expensive paneling to have been put in underneath the stair, still less for it to have been hidden behind the two studs that you can see in front of it, which now support the new and unplanned staircase. Just imagine the testy exchange between the demanding but indecisive client and his frustrated joiner trying to provide work in a superior manner, but having to hide it away in closets. The days of building houses, according to long established conventions were over, but the practice of building had not yet evolved through the array of systems required for putting up complex unconventional houses. Still in the future were comprehensive sets of construction drawings and lengthy building contracts to say nothing of building inspectors and boards of architectural review. Finished joinery isn't the only place where we can see difficulties between William Kirkland and his builders. Airmount was one of the earliest brick buildings in Orange County. It was at the forefront of a wave of brick building for institutions and prestigious houses in the region. It was a pioneer. Its masonry was well laid and has withstood the test of two centuries of Piedmont weather. Its quality speaks in a sense for itself. That said, there are aspects of its execution which reflect a lack of experience on the part of its masons and perhaps the infancy of brick construction in the region. One of the places that this is most visible is in its decorative masonry around doors and windows, an element that became a source of contention between Kirkland and his mason, William Collier. The best English masons and the best Virginia masons of the 18th century understood well how to make this specialized work look neat and uniform and regular. They set specially shaped bricks in very tight mortar joints using a special type of mortar known as lime putty to make compositions like this one for the frontispiece at Carter's Grove in James City County, Virginia. This detail shows clearly the distinction in color, texture, shape, and regularity between the body bricks at the left and the rubbed and gauged bricks at the right. It also makes clear how such perfectly shaped bricks permitted the Mason's ideal of astonishingly thin, bright white mortar joints between those specialized bricks. The rubbed and gauged jack arches at Airmount show that William Collier knew what the target was, but was not yet experienced enough to hit it. The bricks and the jack arches above all the window openings are not as finely shaped or as tightly fitted together. The mortar joints are thicker and the color of the bricks indistinguishable from the body bricks. To an untrained eye, these were close enough, but for a demanding client or a scrupulous critic, or even an attentive historian, the difference between the ideal and the execution here is significant. And so it is poignant or fitting that it was brickwork that was the subject of a dispute between Kirkland and William Collier. In a letter about the project, Kirkland complained, Mr. Collier has presented me with an account of the brickwork done on my house. I think he charges me with laying a great many more brick than there is in the house. He also charges $1 for every arch in the house. He also charges for penciling and repairing joints. Kirkland objected to Collier's charging a dollar for each rubbed and gauged jack arch. He did not see the value in paying any extra for this work, though he did not make any mention of its quality, rather simply the additional charge, which he felt unwarranted. Kirkland wanted an ambitious house and he sought out builders that could, do an, that could do ambitious work, but watchful merchant that he was, he grumbled about the money. Collier likely grumbled about the money too, and surely not who kept having to redo his wainscoting, nor were they alone. It was not just William Kirkland who questioned their means of pricing or, resent, who, or who resented paying extra for decorative doodads of uncertain value. It is surely not coincidental 
that just months after the completion of Airmount, Elias Fort convened a meeting of builders in Hillsborough. Its purpose, in Fort's words, was for forming uniform rules whereby the measurement and prices of work may in future be regulated. From the various methods now used, disagreement and strife is engendered and many lawsuits occasioned. Another way of putting it is this. Elias Fort and his fellow tradesmen wanted to ensure that the price of architectural ambition was paid by the region's clients, not its builders. Thank you. Anybody has questions, um, just a reminder to put them in the uh, the question and answer box. And I have a couple questions that I'm going to hopefully ask right. first. Um, so it, it's clear that Mr. Kirkland had an idea of what he wanted and specific details. Why do you think it is that he did hire local tradespeople instead of kind of importing that work where he knew he would get the exact details that he wanted? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think part of it is um, it's, a, it's a matter of um, uh, infrastructure. Uh, so yes, he could have imported Welford mantles and he actually could have imported mantles from London or even Italy at this point if he really wanted them. But of course, those were extravagantly expensive. Um, but the infrastructure wasn't yet there to bring all those tradespeople to the place on a sort of temporary basis and and to bring them on a temporary basis again would have would have increased the cost uh, considerably because you have to house then and feed those people while they're on site um so i think it was simply the best option available to him um and i think he got the house that he wanted i think it was just a struggle uh i think it was a struggle for him and it was a struggle for his builders. And, and if I put my cards on the table, I think I'm I'm more sympathetic to the builders in this case than, than to, to William Kirkland. Um, well, we, we got two questions that are kind of on the same line and were aligned with my second question to you. Um, so a question from okay. David Cates um, wants to know, were there drawn plans for this house or were there just the half drawings known? We, um, well, if there are, we haven't seen them. We haven't found them. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll just say sort of parenthetically, but, uh, you know, relevant to this is, is drawn plans are still the exception in this period. Uh, you know, as, as many of you probably know, that's changing. We're getting people like Charles Bullfinch and Benjamin Henry, Henry Latrobe who, um, you know, market their services as professionals. And part of that work does involve the creation of drawings. Those drawings are usually restricted to plans and elevations. Um, there are a few sections for really elaborate buildings, like a couple of Latrobe's churches. There are there are more extensive drawings, but for the most part, this is a period when. Well, let me put it this way: as as my talk tried to articulate, this is a period in which the conventional ways of building that didn't require drawings are being um, are, are changing, and and buildings are becoming less conventional. And I think what we'll see over the next few decades is um, drawings becoming a necessary part of the building process for high quality houses like this one. Um, that's not to say that, that drawings weren't made. I think it's entirely possible that drawings were made. Um, we simply haven't found them, but I wouldn't expect it, I think is another way to answer that question. And I think I think maybe the, um, the difficulty with these two staircases um is is suggesting that drawings were in fact not made or if they were that that um you know william kirkland wasn't adept at understanding them but it's a it's a it's a nice question it's a, it's a kind of fundamental it's a critical question uh for the for the design and building process in this period well kind of piggybacking on that question sarah woodard was asking if we know what the original plan for the staircase location was which i'm assuming we don't but I really wonder about that. And I'll tell you where I think the answer is. And I'm not saying this as a suggestion to anybody, um, but I suspect that an opening was framed in the second floor ceiling to get people from the passage to the, to the second floor. Um, and that would tell us where the original stair was meant to be. I suspect, even though it's a very high ceiling up there, uh, it's possible it was just a tight winder stair sort of boxed into the corner. Well, so, so um, sorry, I didn't finish my thought. Um, the evidence for that stair may well be still in the ceiling framing um, up on the, on the second floor. 
Uh, but I, I wouldn't I wouldn't suggest that anybody go tearing out the ceiling. But one day, should some new HVAC go in, or you know, there be some other opportunity to look in there, um, we should certainly take a look and see if we can figure that out. Um, so what I would expect, just being backstage and um, leading up to attic space, that it that it was a much simpler stair than the one that they put in. But I could also imagine. Well, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, we don't know. We don't know. We don't have any evidence for that. I guess is the way to put it. And um, another question by David Cates um, is asking: Is it possible that these staircases were originally planned to not have closets under them? And I'm going to add on to that because um, it just occurred to me, even though I saw your a little preview of this presentation a while back and um mm -hmm. that the area where that wainscot terminates under the stairs just drives me crazy um <laughs> how do we know that that um that that passageway was closed off during the original construction or is it possible that that maybe occurred a couple years down the line like after living in the house was that movement changed yeah that's a very attentive question. So I think the answer, the truthful answer is yes, um, that it could have happened soon after um, even they, they occupied the building. And I say that because um, I, oh, I love, the reason I think it happens while the house is under construction is partly because of what happens upstairs and partly because the, the character of the wainscoting, the flat panel wainscoting under the stair matches some of the other wainscoting in the building um, in other parts of the house. Uh, but you're right. It's not a slam dunk in the way that it is upstairs, where it doesn't, excuse me, where it doesn't even get painted, um, where it just it couldn't be clearer. So to really answer that question um, would require some some paint analysis and maybe a little bit of um, judicious digging with a scalpel, uh, for example, to see um, uh, whether the paint history can can help us answer that question. Um, I think one way to, to answer it might be um, to, to do a little paint analysis, and this would be the easiest way to do some paint analysis on the uh, wainscoting that's under the closet on the first floor um, to see if that was only painted for the first time in you know 1930 or something. Uh, that that would be the, the the kind of cleanest and probably the most efficient way to answer that question. Um, in terms of uh, so so, but I suspect it's. Uh, under construction or very soon after. Um, there was another question about whether the closet was originally planned or something. I, I don't think, I think it was only intended from day one to be a, a, a vestibule. Another, you would duck under the stair to get into the little back room, making that even less convenient. So I think all that, that walling that off did was to remove access completely. So it's no longer inconvenient. It's impossible from the passage to the little back room. And the reason I think it's important, or one of the reasons I think it's important is, of course, you know, it's part of this larger story, but also it speaks to the, the use of that back room, that, that little back room that we're sort of struggling to figure out what it was for. It makes it emphatically private, right? Where it can only be accessed from the dining room or the chamber. It really is, it's a kind of deliberate effort to remove access to it from, from the, the public part of the house, the passage. Another question, where was the kitchen located and was it detached? Um, so there was an out, yeah, there was an outside kitchen. Um, unfortunately, you know, one of the one of the disappointments of, of this site is that the outbuildings, at least many of them survived into the 20th century, but were, were torn down or fell over in the first half of the 20th century and um, weren't in place in 1985. Um, but there was, there's a, there's a probate inventory from 1836 when William, when William Kirkland died and that that uh, um, enumerates some of the outbuildings. Um, and it's a pretty conventional set of outbuildings, but there's a little bit of, there's some clues in there about use. Um, but there was an outside kitchen. There is also, this does survive in the cellar underneath the dining room. There's a very small heated room with a paved floor. Um, and I think it had a wane, excuse me, a, a whitewashed ceiling, but not a plastered ceiling uh, and, a, and a window a glazed window to bring in some light that clearly had some kind of domestic function was just as clearly very much backstage. It's in the cellar. Um, the, the question is, the question then becomes, is this part of the service function? Is this a sort of staging area for bringing food into the house much as um, Thomas Jefferson had at Monticello and a few other gentry builders had a sort of, you'd have an outside kitchen and then a, a kind of uh, place to, to set things up inside the house. 
uh, or what I think is more likely is it's a it's a quarter. Um, we we have some idea of the number of enslaved people living on this site, um, and uh, it is it's a it's a it's a common I won't say a good location. It's a common location for uh, a member of the enslaved domestic staff to 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 have a place in the cellar. Um, a question from Robin Jones. How long did construction of a house like this one take, especially with the homeowner and the craftsman arguing? Yeah, <laughs> uh, I think it's about a year. Um, if, if Jean Anderson is on the call, she could probably tell us from memory based on based on the Kirkland papers exactly when he gets back from Scotland, but he makes a trip to Scotland, Kirkland does, and he gets back, I think it is in early 1814 or late 1813. And it is the middle of 1815 that he's starting to write his grumpy letters. Um, so it, it's it's about a year, let's say, give or take. Um, and that seems pretty typical. There are, of course, building projects that dragged on for years and years. Um, but I think anywhere from, you know, three to six months to a year and a half is is sort of where the most of the bell curve is, uh, at least in this period. Not hugely different from today. Um, a question from Michael Phillips asking, could you talk a bit about the influences and the builders traveling back and forth between North Carolina and Virginia in this period? Seems as though there are some obvious differences as well as similarities. Yeah, a, a number of people, uh, including one of my colleagues, Robert Leaf, have identified a lot of uh, correspondence, visual correspondence, but also movement back and forth between um, uh, the Piedmont of North Carolina and really the southeast, the south side of, of Virginia. Um, I can't speak to that articulately, so I'm, I'm reluctant to say too much uh, for this audience, but, but that clearly is something that's going on, even if you just even a sort of cursory look at some of the documents about where some of these tradespeople are born and where they're working. There's quite a few, not just tradespeople, merchants and, and other people uh, who have moved to this part of North Carolina from um, Southside Virginia. So there, there does, for whatever reason, um, and, a, and a, someone else can probably speak to this better than I can, there does seem to be a lot of, I think exchange is probably the word that I would use uh, between those two parts of the world. Uh, well, speaking of another part of the world, uh, Myra Coward wants to know, to what extent does this house reflect Kirkland's Scottish heritage? Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's such an interesting question. And, and you know, there are places, there are, there are buildings, as Myra knows well, and as many of you know well, where the sort of ethnic origins of, of builders, and here I mean patrons, are abundantly clear, um, particularly in Germanic settled parts of, of North Carolina, of Virginia, and, and of Pennsylvania. Um, there are Dutch traditions uh, some of you may know about. Um, I was just looking at a house three days ago in um, Frederick, Maryland, that has that's a built with a Dutch H-bent um, frame. It's just extraordinary. So there are moments where it's really, really, really clear um, the the kind of the the uh, national. Uh, origin of, of builders. And, and we sort of take English origin for granted, the sort of English tradition uh, for granted. I think in the case of Airmount, uh, you know, I, I cannot claim to having scoured the length and breadth of Scotland in search of, of an antecedent for Airmount, but I have to say, I don't think it's necessary. I, I see it so um, as being so much a part of this larger tradition of A, three-part houses, this kind of established tradition of multi-part houses, uh, in the first couple of decades of the 19th century, and B, this sort of um, freewheeling neoclassicism, um, particularly a kind that's that's um, uh, not centered in cities, uh, that I don't think you need to really look any farther than that. Now, that's not to say that there isn't some some little piece of Scotland uh, in this building, but to me, the the um, the things that really jump out are these, are its, are its rootedness really in in the new United States and the and the sort of the superior manner that Elhanan Nutt is claiming that that he can bring uh, to the to the residents of this part of the world. Uh, that's what that's what Kirkland is embracing. Um, I mean, it's probably worth qualifying that a little bit um, because it is. I think you can make a case for its Europeanness and its being a three part house. But as I tried to indicate. It's it's such a common thing the three part that three part form, um, and has been for fifty years or more at this well fifty years let's say, um, 
I think that that's really the more important. It's it's North American. It's North American um, uh, inheritance is more important than it's whatever whatever little piece of Scotland might be in there. But I would love to learn otherwise. If there's somebody out there that says there's a house just like this, you know, at the edge of air, I, I would love to learn that. But but um, I haven't I haven't seen that yet. Um, question from Terry Buckner: Has there been any work to identify the role of the enslaved in the spaces they used at Air Mount? Yes, to the first. Um, you know, they there we have some sense of numbers. Uh, I'm now going to mix up Milford, which is the other site whose whose slave population I've been trying to um, uh, understand more clearly. I, I can't remember the numbers that we have at Airmount, but they are, we have two, two sources of information about them, both of them having to do with Kirkland's death. There are two inventories, one in 1836, the other 1838. And between the two of them, we have numbers. Um, we have a couple of names and a couple of uh, trades uh, associated with the enslaved workers that are part of his estate. Um, and so there are a few things that we can say about them. Uh, they seem to have been working in some of Kirkland's shops in town, uh, but surely a number of them were involved in domestic work on the site, and a number of them uh, certainly were involved in agricultural work on the site. Um, in terms of where they lived in the house, the, the one place where it seems most likely is that little room that I described under the dining room, that little heated room in the cellar. Um, I think probably what belong on the table in terms of thinking about where they might also have been are the two very small and apparently unheated rooms um, in the wings, in the second floor of the wings, one of which is accessible directly from the passage, the other of which is only accessible from the secondary bedchamber on the second floor. So there's at least one and possibly three spaces that might be associated with enslaved workers. All three of those, I think most likely, almost certainly would have been, um, if they were used for that purpose, for uh, domestic staff, uh, cooks, laundry, um, uh, a nurse, a nursemaid conceivably. Uh, this, is, this is a very large family. Um, although ha having said that, uh, I suspect that the outbuildings enumerated in the inventory were where most of the people, most of the enslaved people on this site lived. Um, so archaeology, uh, we really want to, I mean, to answer these questions and to be able to speak more articulately about uh, the character of those buildings and the character of that work um, will require archaeology, which I um, is a high priority for this organization. Uh, question from Catherine Beicher. How long had Kirkland and Duncan Cameron been rich before they built these big houses? And is that significant? <laughs> Oh, Catherine, you can probably answer that question better than I can. How long had they been rich? Well, um, I mean, one way I think to read the the Air Mount, the construction of Air Mount, is this is this is uh, Kirkland saying, "Well, I've made it, and this is my reward for making it." Uh, you know, it's a sort of uh, as well. Some people um, read architecture as a an indication of aspiration, and I think that is one way to read it. Another read architecture, uh, at least at this kind of high level as, uh, as a, a signifier of uh, achievement. And I think maybe, maybe the fairest way to answer it, and I don't want to psychoanalyze William Kirkland too, too baldly, uh, it's a little bit of both, I suspect, for, for, um, for Kirkland. For Cameron, I, I don't know his story nearly well enough to, to, you know, to begin to answer that question. But Catherine, maybe you can put the answer in the chat because I suspect you do know the answer, or at least have a, a notion about an answer. Um, a question from Betty Stoddard. She wants to know, what did the houses of neighbors look like where they have a similar design or simple, more rudimentary buildings? And I'll just add my own little question on there. Um, what was the size of the original um, property or like generally? Because I know it was enormous. Uh, yeah, it's in, it's in the four to 500 acre range. Um, you know, when he when he builds the house, I've forgotten exactly what the number is, but it's in that range. It's substantial. Um, what were the what were the other buildings? So um, I myself have just really started to dig into this. Um, there are a few surviving more than a few surviving houses in Hillsborough and in the, the environs of Hillsborough from this period. For the most part, they're much more modest. Um, you know, a couple of room, one or two rooms, um, 
wooden, uni universally wooden. Um, there's a very nice one uh, that's been moved right to the center of town that sort of that sort of uh, illustrates that. That's the offices for the Alliance of Historic Hillsborough called the Dickinson House. Um, the finishes survive pretty well too. So if you sort of want to get a sense for it, um, I think that's occasionally open. I'm not sure what their schedule is right now, but it's uh, it hasn't in the past been open to the public. I'll put it that way. So that's a good one to get a handle on what a kind of middling house was. If you if you want to say typical, I think that'd be all right. There are a few architecturally ambitious houses um, in Hillsboro and and in the area right outside Hillsboro, including I think two three part houses. Uh, one is Moorfields, the other, I'm blanking on the name, but that's the one that's right in town. Um, there were others who were building sort of impressively in this period, um, but those houses are very eccentrically planned. And so uh, I think, you know, you can kind of get a sense for people trying to, to um, master this language, master this form, I guess. There's a, there's a um, well, I'll stop that thought there. I think that maybe the way to summarize is this is clearly the best house for miles around. Um, and uh, it was meant to be the best house for miles around. It was really meant to to kind of be this, you know, not a city on a hill, but a, a mansion on a hill. Um, there's nothing else uh, around it and and wasn't for for a long time afterwards. It was only when the kind of the brick building tradition in, in Hillsborough took off. When the brick building tradition in Hillsborough took off, it was mostly, not entirely, but mostly institutional buildings, the Masonic Lodge, the, the, the church just up St. Mary's Road, uh, and then of course the Great Courthouse. Um, that's it's those that sequence of buildings that I think it's probably fair to say uh, Airmount had some role in initiating um, that, that you get this kind of uh, this practice of building really impressively, but it's institutions rather than individuals. So it stood out. Two more questions. Um, what was the third floor used for? What was up there? Oh, I, I'm sorry, I didn't show you images of the third floor. The third floor um, that has that grand stair, mm -hmm. right, running up that very kind of genteel stair, although it doesn't fit very well. If you If you go in, you'll see that that the ceiling and uh, support beam has been sort of cut away to prevent people from cracking their head open uh, as they go up and down the stair. Um, it seems to be, I read it, I should say, as uh, children's bedrooms. Uh, conceivably, conceivably, uh, one small bedroom up there was a, was a guest room, but uh, there's a very large sort of bunk room under the eaves, uh, very spacious off the top of my head. I couldn't give you the dimensions, but um, I bet it's 25 feet square. Uh, and then a smaller bedroom, both of them heated by a single fireplace, uh, all at the top of that stair. Um, you could you could stick a bunch of kids in the very large bedroom. It's well enough finished. Uh, they're both well enough finished uh, with a wooden mantle and respectable doors that I don't read them as um, quarters for enslaved people. I read them as, as either... Um, bedrooms for guests or more likely for uh, children. I see them as, as kids' rooms. Okay. Um, and the final question is from Lisa Gonzalez um, asking if Airmount is open to visitors. Well, not yet, I'm sorry to say. Uh, the grounds are, the grounds have never stopped being open. Um, uh, the Classical American Homes has, has worked hard to keep the grounds uh, maintained and accessible during um, COVID. Uh, just as we were starting to develop a plan for reopening, um, uh, everyone became concerned about uh, the pandemic again, and so we've we've um, we've hit the pause button on reopening. There are plans, though. I will say this: there are plans to reopen, and in fact, to reopen in conjunction with uh, a small number of other historic sites in the region, so that there'll be a little um, a sort of circuit that you can make okay. of it, that includes air mount. Um, it'll be rolled out sort of slowly at first, but then, um, uh, and, and well, I won't make any more promises, but they, we do want to open it back up to the public. It's clearly very important for us to do that. Um, and we're, we're working out just how to do that uh, right now. So, so come back soon. Well, and I'll say uh, just walking the grounds is a treat in itself. That's mm -hmm. one of my son's favorite oh, places fabulous. to go hiking. It's beautiful. Oh, good. Yeah. Oh, good. I'm so glad to hear that. <laughs> yeah, it's wonderful. 
Well, thank you so much, Dr. Klee. This has been a, a great presentation and we really appreciate it. Thanks to all of you. I'm very glad to do it. Thank you. Bye-bye.